this rather nicely takes us on to <coughs> Liz, I think, because in the, um, the report that you were one of the authors of, the ICESDF, I think we did try and grapple with this question of all these range of sets of flows and so some insights, but also in a, we've had the OECD perspective, the multilateral perspective, also um, DFID as a bilateral actor, particularly concerned with international public finance, which will be interesting. So please um, welcome any comments that you have. Okay, thanks so much. Well, I'm not going to speak actually as a bilateral okay. actor. I'm going to speak to the, to, the, to the work of the committee and the sort of please big do. set of things. And then I, I mean, actually, uh, Kapil's made my job much, much easier because I mean, I think ev I absolutely endorse everything that he said. And I think he's laid out for us without me having to repeat it and done it far more effectively than I could have done, kind of quite how much the world has changed. And I think that was the starting point for us. Um, so I was the, but so, so what, let me let me talk a bit more, hone in on the committee, the work of the committee, where that took us to, and what that might mean for the finance for development process going forwards, and perhaps to think about how we bring the real world changes that Kapila has described into the UN politics, and I think that's the sort of nub of the challenge for us. How do we how do we how do we not miss this opportunity? So um, I was the UK person on the, uh, on the uh, Intergovernmental Committee of Experts on Sustainable Development Financing. It took me all of the year to learn what the title was. <laughs> uh, we, we had a, a year, five sessions, so quite an intense sort of process, um, and we produced a report at the end of it. And I think in some ways, um, you know, those of you who are much more experienced in UN processes than, than, than I will, will, will have your own senses to, to where we succeeded and where we failed. But I think um, probably one of the headline successes of the report was it did actually put some of that real world <coughs> narrative into a UN report, which is, uh, which is not a small thing. Um, you know, it's not a small thing to do. And, and that's the, the, the how we take that platform forwards and how we move forward. Um, and bring uh, the real world into UN politics and make sure we don't miss the opportunity to get the best possible deal on goals and finance for the world and for the changes that we're seeking, I think is the, the challenge that we all face um, over the next few months. One, one of the, um, Kevin, you were sort of saying, we've all been in, some of us have been in this business too long now and you start to see these things come back around. One of my reflections is around the danger of when things get capitals. So uh, development finance, you know, development finance, capital D, capital F, it becomes a thing that we start to sort of think of in very narrow terms. And what we did as a committee was try to sort of strip back and think about what is it that finances development. And just as Kapil said, thinking about development in that way of this is the, nor this is the process by which countries grow, transform, develop. Um, it's not just some small part of how countries change. We're thinking about development as the whole way in which countries change. And so we're thinking about what's all the finance that goes into, into, into financing those, those changes, those investments, those processes. Um, and, and that's a very different starting point from starting with What's development finance? Well, it's ODA, it's non-concessional flows, it's this, it's that. And I think that shifting round to sort of thinking about everything that finances development was what we tried to do. Uh, we also tried to start with the data. And I think, again, Kapil, you showed us you know, some of the data in the way of Africa's changed. To start with the data rather than starting with the, the political discourse. Because if you start with the political discourse, which is um, how much will it cost to achieve these goals? Who's going to pay for it? Where can we get that money from? You're kind of lost because that's not the real world. So to try and start with, um, with, with, with the real world of, of, of what's financing development, start with the data. And the data, of course, is incredibly um, powerful in terms of the, the scale of change over the last 10, 20 years. Um, the growth in domestic resources, uh, the, the changing role of ODA, incre you know, really stark figures around the decreasing number of, of countries for whom ODA is absolutely critical, but those countries really, you know, for them, for those smaller and reducing number of countries, uh, ODA still is really critical, but for the vast majority of countries now, the game is elsewhere. What's financing development is countries' own resources and private flows, and that, you know, that has to be the reality from which we start, recognising very, very clearly then uh, the countries which don't fit to that pattern yet and where ODA is a, is a, is a really critical component. So, uh, so, so that was one thing. We tried to start with the data. We also tried to really um, harness the uh, developing country finance ministry perspective because I think, you know, as, as, as you were saying as well, Kapil, actually, when you talk to finance ministries, um, you know, well, they may give you the older story, but actually what was quite interesting in the, in the committee was that most people didn't start with the older story. And in fact, it was, it was really strong developing country Ministry of Finance voices that started saying really powerfully in a way which is not always heard in UN committees, um, you know, our, what, our, our vision is not just to get a bit more older, and a bit more older won't finance development in our countries. Um, 
you know, whether it was whether it was um, permanent secretary of the Ministry of Finance in St Lucia, whether if it was Joseph Nimu from Uganda, uh, Lukita Dinash from from Indonesia, you know, the Ministry of Finance voices were absolutely critical, and they helped change the nature of the debate and start with the reality of the world, and then think about how we could move it forwards. The other thing we did, um, uh, which was which is very natural to me, I started life as a natural scientist, so I sort of think in ecosystem terms. We did try to think of the kind of finance ecosystem, the way in which flows move around the world, and what uh, what uh, what changes the nature of those flows. We thought it was important to think about flows out of developing countries as well as flows into developing countries. So the whole illicit flows point came out as well. Um, and looking at what are the global rules and the policies at a national level and internationally which condition those flows and which change the nature of those flows. So, so I think that was the approach we tried to take. Um, what worked well in the report and where do we get to and where does it, where does it take us uh, to going forwards? I think the report does have uh, a really clear strategic approach, which which uh, which is which is worth looking at. Even uh, small things, which seem quite normal and natural, but to get them into a into a UN report was was no small feat. Uh, the idea that um, that financing multiple objectives is normal, and that synergies are a good thing rather than a bad thing. If you're starting from a position where you're trying to uh, maximise every single separate flow, you want to argue against uh, synergies. You want to argue that each and every flow needs to be additional and that you're working in a world where everything needs to be financed separately. And again, that's not the real world. And, a, and, a, and the real world embraces synergies and says this is fantastic if we can use one resource to achieve multiple objectives. Um, so so that, 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 that made it into the strategic approaches. If, if, if you want to do nothing other than read just paragraph 61 with a set of strategic approaches in the report, I would recommend you do. They're, they're, they're I think, the heart of it. Uh, as I said, it looked at all sources, uh, and it looked at not just mobilisation but effective use. You know, you could, if you, you, some of the some of the changes that you can get from using resources more effectively, far more than getting a little bit extra in terms of mobilising. <coughs> I think the report's quite realistic. It doesn't pretend that there's any easy answers to this. You know, development is a messy process. Financing for development is a messy process. There's absolutely no straightforward question. So it does, it does, it does sort of say, you know, the real world is not so simple as buying some outcomes. Uh, this is not a procurement process. Development is, is very different. And, uh, and I think it put very, very firmly on the table the importance of policies and policy change both at the domestic, at, at the national level and at the international level. And so it says what we're trying to do is change the finance ecosystem and that's not just by moving money around. So we're not saying well, let's take this piece of money and give it over here. We're saying what changes that can be the policies and the environment in which finance flows happen. So that's as important. So the non-finance actions that result in change to financing are as important as, as sort of things with dollar signs on them. The weaknesses of the report. Well, the report didn't go anywhere near as far in terms of specifying a set of really well thought through policy options and recommendations as I think we would have aspired at the beginning uh, of, that, of, the, of the year. Um, maybe we had unrealistic expectations, but we, we set ourselves the kind of um, aspiration of really being able to specify quite clearly what some of those packages <coughs> of action, national change, international change, uh, what, what some of those packages really might look like that would, that would, that would make the biggest difference. And I think we, we got a lot of the right stuff on the table, many of the same issues that, 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 you, that, that John, you, you and Kapil have picked up, um, but we didn't specify them to the level of what, uh, what would really, you know, how, how can we actually start to use that within the context of the FFD process and the overall post-2015 deal. The other thing that, uh, so we need to take those policy areas and, and develop them much further. The other thing which I think we, we got some way towards doing but didn't get as far as we would have liked to have done is really um, hearing a very, you know, the really getting, uh, and I think this is still to be done, uh, a really strong articulation from developing countries themselves as to what will make the most difference for them in the context of this broad picture. Uh, what do they need the international system to do to change? What are the what are the international tax rules that need to change? Uh, what are the what's the support that they would like from international public finance, and how would they use that? You know that kind of re really targeting down on on um, on different areas and really getting the developing country voice expressed in that. To, which is the real world voice rather than the rather stale political discourse that we do sometimes get. And I think that, you know, the, the reason why this matters so much over these next few months is this opportunity will not come round again quickly. 
Um, and, and who knows how many of us in this room will still be active professionally when we get to the end of this <laughs> next stage. But, you know, this is our time to try and do this. The world has moved so far. We have to not let the processes still stay 10 years behind. I think that's the opportunity. And that is a lot for me about um, developing countries expressing their asks in ways which really challenge the international system and challenge international actors, but go way beyond uh, calling for uh, a bit more odour. I think within that, odour is going to be, you know, is a critical part of it, but it, but it, it absolutely is not everything. Just to put on the table four or five things that I think for me came out as being particularly uh, prospective areas for further work, uh, and I think they, they're, 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 there's, there's a lot in common. The whole area of domestic resource mobilisation. Uh, I mean, there's been so much progress in the last in the last few years, both in terms of countries' uh, own increases in their in their in, in terms of tax reform, their increases in revenue, um, but also in uh, international action. But absolutely, we need to really leverage that to the next level. So, really going forwards on all of those fronts, what would that mean? Can we come out with something that really clearly says, you know, any country that has a credible process of reform in place will be supported? You know, the finance will be there internationally to support that in terms the capacity. Infrastructure finance came out really critically and, uh, and, and like you Kapil and completely we were struck by this uh, uh, you know the, the opportunity represented by pension funds. There should be a complete alignment between the sorts of time frames that pension funds investors are interested in and sustainable development mm -hmm. and somehow that is not quite working so what is it that we can do to free that up? Is it risk mitigation <laughs> instruments? You know is, is it more uh, is it more capacity? in developing countries for deal for deal making for project preparation that came through really strongly the sense that you know africa is is in a completely different place but the capacity within within many african countries still to really make sure they're getting the best deals to do the deal making in a way that works for them um, you know feels like it's still still weak on capacity Odor targeting, really thinking about how we target odor better, uh, felt like a really big issue too. Um, and then, and then I think the final one I would say is a sort of un the underpinner of um, of transparency. So make so we, you know the data that we have currently, we have quite a lot of data, but as you said, John, we certainly don't have it across the, the breadth of areas that we're interested in. So really making some more progress on transparency and recognizing that you know South South cooperation, there was some interesting um, there was some interesting commitment to say actually South South cooperation needs to become more transparent. I think some of those things could help to to give again to give finance ministries and others uh, other actors in developing countries much more information with which to uh, to get the to get better to better, get better outcomes in terms of financing. Um, if I had to just throw another couple into the mix, fossil fuel subsidies I think came out as a really interesting area again, uh, and, and uh, points that others have picked up around illicit flows and return of stolen assets. But I think you know the heart of it is how do we make sure the politics catches up with the real <coughs> world and we don't miss this opportunity. Thank you so much.